Uh, thanks for joining us for the discussion today uh, of the, the war on Ukraine. Uh, this is one of the many discussions we've had at SEPA since Russia's invasion of Ukraine on February 24th of this year. Um, that invasion represents uh, perhaps the most significant threat to peace and security in Europe since the end of the Cold War. It is obviously uh, had dire effects on the people uh, of Ukraine, and it's also had destabilizing effects around the world uh, in uh, various aspects, uh, military, economic, uh, social, uh, and humanitarian. Uh, we're pleased to be undertaking today's discussion through our International Fellows Program. Um, I wanna thank the uh, many IFP students and alumni uh, for joining us online today. Uh, the IFP program is extremely important to SEPA. It's extremely important to Columbia. It's 60 years old uh, and uh, it has selected uh, top students to uh, work on uh, an intensive study of foreign policy while, uh, as while they're graduate students at SEPA. Um, the program brings together a diverse group of students in terms of background and in terms of, uh, uh, of national origin. Uh, many of our alumni for the IFP program have gone on to senior roles in government, in the private sector, in multilateral institutions, academia, and elsewhere. Um, and it's a tremendous network that's been built. Uh, there are 2,000 IFP alumni out there, and they hail from 60 different countries and territories. Um, we've been really fortunate at Columbia and at SEPA to have uh, Professor Steve Sistanovich directing the IFP program. Uh, it's an amazing program and it's, uh, an, it's an amazing program today in large part because of his contributions. Uh, he's a great leader of the program. He's a great scholar. Uh, he's a great public servant with a, a rich history of uh, leadership in the US government. Uh, perhaps most notably from 1997 to 2001, Steve served as ambassador at large and special advisor to the US Secretary of State uh, on the new independent states of the former Soviet Union. Um, and it really, this role pr provides him, uh, that experience provides him a great perspective on uh, what's going on today with Russia and Ukraine and with the rest of the region. And uh, he's been an uh, absolute indispensable resource for the many programs that we've had uh, since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, it, it has really gripped SEPA uh, we've had uh, a lot of programs on a lot of different aspects of, uh, of uh, the situation in, in the region and uh, the, the brutal invasion and its implications for uh, the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian nation. Um, Steve uh, has a rich history before his uh, service as ambassador at large in the US government, uh, State Department, uh, National Security Council, um, and on Capitol Hill. Uh, and he has served uh, in various uh, leading think tanks in the United States, like the Carnegie Endowment for Peace, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, et cetera, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations. And uh, at SEPA, he has, uh, he has served as the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Professor of International uh, Diplomacy. And he is a, a very accomplished author and his most recent book is Maximalist, America in the World from Truman to Obama. Uh, I, I strongly recommend uh, people to read that book if you haven't already. And I am very pleased uh, to turn over the reins to Steve. Um, thank you for coming. This is a very important topic. Um, and uh, Steve is the natural person to lead this incredible panel. And I wanted to thank all the panelists for joining us. It's a nice mix of, of faculty, alum, and, and one student. And um, uh, I really look forward to hearing some of your comments. Uh, and uh, over to you, Steve. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, I wanna thank Tom and uh, our alumni for the continuing support they and SEPA give to the International Fellows Program. Uh, I should note, perhaps, since we've got alumni on this uh, on this call, that uh, for many of you, the trip to Washington, D.C. was a big part of your IFP experience. Uh, this week, we are resuming it in person for the first time in three years. Uh, I should also note that we'll do breakout rooms at the end of the panel discussion. 
uh, at which point uh, Susan Storms, our Director of Alumni Affairs, will direct you to uh, the appropriate room. Uh, Susan will also field uh, questions uh, for anybody who wants to uh, pose a question through the chat, but you'll also be able to put up your hands uh, and I can uh, call on you on that basis uh, in the once we're, we've finished a little introductory discussion uh, among our panelists. Uh, I want to dive right into the war. Uh, at some point in almost any crisis over the past half century, somebody quotes Winston Churchill, uh, who said after the Battle of El Alamein, uh, this is not the end, it's not even the beginning of the end, it, but it may be the end of the beginning. And this seems to me a good theme for us today. Uh, you know, where are we in this war? Uh, what are the expectations and preferences of the major participants? Who's best prepared for a long war, uh, which many people are forecasting? Uh, who most needs a short one, which some people say uh, is uh, an imperative and uh, even and political, politically important for, uh, for Putin and why. Uh, we keep hearing that Putin wants a victory by May 9th. Um, we see pictures every day of destruction in Ukraine that makes it hard to imagine how the people there can summon the strength to go on uh, beyond that. Uh, but as I said, we also hear forecasts that this may be a war of years. Uh, we hear NATO defense ministers uh, meeting today, talking about the need to make sure Russia is weakened over the, uh, over the long term. So I wanna dig into uh, those topics with our um, terrific panelists, uh, a group of SEPA alumni, all of them SEPA alumni, or at least two, uh, one a current student, uh, and two IFP alumni. Uh, first, Josh Yaffa, who writes for The New Yorker um, and is normally based in Moscow. He is the author of a terrific book called Between Two Fires that I recommend to, uh, to, uh, to all of you. He has spent uh, six weeks of the past two months in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, second, we have Yulia Petsik, uh, who is from Ukraine and enlivened our IFP discussions uh, in 2020 and 2021 uh, with that uh, perspective. Uh, finally, uh, Professor Tim Fry of the Columbia Political Science Department, uh, an MIA uh, from 1991, author most recently of a book on Putin called Weak Strongman. Um, <clears throat> Josh, I want to start with you, if we could. Um, and maybe you can tell us where you are. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, you know, what are your impressions, since you spent the most time in Ukraine uh, of anybody in this group, um, of the attitudes and thinking of the Zelensky team uh, about where they stand now? Uh, what they've accomplished, what their big problems ahead are. Um, does their success make them think a full victory is uh, possible? Uh, or, or, you know, is it, uh, are they most afraid of a uh, defeat as the Russian forces regroup? Uh, is there public support for a, uh, for a long war? Why don't you introduce us to some of those themes and then we'll turn to uh, our other panelists. Sure. Thanks, uh, Steve, for the introduction and the question. I'm, I'm coming to you live from Yerevan, Armenia, where I've um, flown to uh, last week after coming out of my latest uh, reporting trip to, to Ukraine, which I'll talk a bit about now and, and my impressions from um, my earlier first reporting trip to Ukraine, which began in the weeks before the war and, and went through the launch of it on February 24th and in, into mid-March. Um, As you said, I've spent I guess I've spent about six weeks of the last two months um, in, in Ukraine with only short trips out to, to recharge. My impression from my last trip was that the Zelensky team, having held Russian forces out of Kiev, essentially having 
for all intents and purposes, one, I think it's fair to say, I'm no sort of military expert myself, but I think it's fair to say one, you know, phase one of the war by, by not losing, right? I mean, that's the other advantage of being the defender as opposed to the attacker. And we can talk a bit about what that means for the next phase is that you can win simply by not losing. Um, and that is, is certainly what Ukrainian side and then some was able to achieve uh, in phase one of the war by keeping Russians out of Kiev and, and, and keeping Russians out of Kharkiv. I mean, keeping Russian forces out of a lot of cities that I, uh, it seems clear Russia imagined it would be able to take with much more ease than turned out to be the case. Um, that gave the Zelensky team confidence that this war is winnable on the terms, again, that that all Ukraine has to do. And I mean, it's not a, it's no small thing, right? And, and will come with great, um, at great cost and, and especially human cost, uh, both in terms of Ukrainian military, but also civilians. But but Ukraine can win this war by not losing it. And then, and the repeat in some sense of the model of the first phase of the war can apply to the second and that Ukraine, uh, the political leadership as well as the military leadership certainly believes it's entirely realistic to keep Russia from fully um, encircling Ukrainian forces in the Donbass from extending de facto Russian writ over the entirety of the administrative borders of the Donetsk and Lugansk regions. That seems to be the kind of plan minimum uh, as far as the Russian side is concerned, the kind of minimal thing that Putin could himself be satisfied with and credibly sell to the Russian public and the Russian elite as a quasi victory that that there's a feeling in Kiev that that's not at all a done deal and that that that's not at all uh, guaranteed and, and we've seen in the last week or so uh, in this new phase with with Russia now having begun for all intents and purposes this um, Donbass offensive, it, it seems to be going slower than uh, Russia forces imagined. We're, we're seeing in a way a kind of repeat of the first phase of the war where Russia sets these ambitious goals and thinks it can achieve them quickly and then uh, come butts up against the reality that, um, you know, the battlefield is, is a much different, you know, arena than, than, um, than, you know, your best laid plans may have led you to, um, to believe. I mean, the ask that I heard over and over from the Zelensky team. And, and the, the rhetoric has changed even just in recent days, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But when I was uh, in Kiev talking to the Zelensky team, and so this is already two weeks ago or so, um, the the ask was for offensive weaponry, that the, that the idea was that Ukrainian forces, as concerns the military situation, were well equipped and knew how to defend territory, how to keep Russian forces from capturing additional territory. Where Ukraine needed help militarily, first and foremost in terms of arms, is going on counteroffensives, how to recapture territory that Russian forces uh, occupy. Uh, I mean, it's extraordinary what happened in the area outside of Kiev in early April in terms of the Russian withdrawal, but that really was more a Russian, a Russian withdrawal than it was Ukraine kind of actively pushing uh, Russian forces out of those areas. I mean, Russian forces weren't able to advance. And so in that sense, we can talk about um, sort of a military success on Ukraine's part, but it wasn't Ukraine using offensive weapons to, to push back Russia. It was Russia making the decision to, to engage in this pullback to refocus on Donbass. And so now, or at least now in the context of two weeks ago, the ask from the Ukrainian side was we need these uh, diff different types of weapon systems, not the defensive weapons that the West supplied in advance of the war and in the early days of the war, but off offensive weapons so we can go on the attack and, and push Russians back from places that they uh, occupy, especially in the south and east, but also areas still around Kharkiv where there's a Russian troop um, presence. Interestingly, in recent days, I saw some comments from Zelensky that says that, that as far as he sees it, the situation has changed for the better in terms of that Ukraine is now getting these kinds of offensive weapon systems. I mean, we saw the news about you know Germany, for example, um, supplying uh, tanks and other equipment, you know, when the, when the Germans are giving military arms, you really know that the, the situation has changed, that the kind of floodgates are um, are open. Um, you know, I'm curious to know what you and the other panels think about the Russian side of the equation. Of course, I still follow Russia closely and, and keep up contacts there and, and keep reading Russian press. It, it seems like Putin and the generals are convinced that they see a path toward military victory. Uh, we saw the comments of this deputy commander, I think, of the Central Military District. Josh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you here. 
because because <laughs> we're going to get to Russia in a moment. Okay. Uh, and right. there's a lot of interesting stuff, and Tim is going to tell us all about that. But I want to first get capture an, an extra part of the Ukraine story by turning to Yulia, and then uh, then go to uh, to Tim with this question, Yulia. That's a little more about uh, the politics and society of the uh, of the story. Uh, you know, one of the extraordinary features of this uh, entire episode has been the emergence of Zelensky as a kind of, you know, world historic celebrity. Uh, you know, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you see his and and your friends and family in Ukraine see his evolution uh, pre-war through the early days and now? uh as a uh, as a you know he's the face of ukraine but he also is atop a political situation and a society that he has to manage and uh, i also be interested in your thoughts about the kind of you know which is related to what josh is talking about the revival of some kind of normalcy in kiev uh is there a you know is the the capital and the country kind of coming back to life in a way that changes the political environment? Okay, and thanks, Joshua, for a really good overview. And I like how you said we <laughs> on the offensive. I like that you're almost <laughs> implying <laughs> that you're. Really, part we of are all Ukrainians <laughs> now. <laughs> that, that, that was a, a, a accidental um, non-journalistic Freudian slip, but but yeah, go, go ahead. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'll talk a little bit on the Zelensky persona and kind of for me, I think the first time I saw Zelensky when I was exactly 10 years old, <laughs> when he started competing in Kavrian, which is a, kind of a, a, a Soviet competition of comedy teams between universities across the Soviet Union and the former Soviet Union. And then he was a, a very significant person for Ukraine because he was the captain of the team that actually won that championship in 2002. And since that, he became the celebrity Ukrainian um, channels and entertainment shows. And so that he became kind of the most prominent um, comedian slash entertainment, not necessarily doing stand up comedy as people in the US would perceive, but usually producing and writing for a lot of the shows. Um, and so he's just kind of a person that I personally almost grew up with, um, just you seeing him on TV and his voice always associates with a joke, a song, an advertisement. So it was really weird dichotomy for us when he switched from a comedian that you see on TV and a part of kind of like good times and laughter. And now all of a sudden he is the leader of the country. And I particularly always worked in the bubble. Uh, there was a big tension in Ukraine between 75% and 25%, the 25% of who voted um, for Poroshenko and then the 75% that voted for Zelensky. Um, I was in the 25% bubble. So obviously, you know, most of my friends were highly critical of Zelensky, making fun of him. Um, sometimes it would almost get ridiculous to the point where whatever he says, even if, I don't know, he scratches his head during the meeting, people would be like, oh, that was so disrespectful. I cannot believe that he scratched his head <laughs> during this meeting. So sometimes the criticism was a little bit over the board. Um, but I think in the days prior to the war, people were in support of his attitude where he was asking people not to panic. And it sounds almost weird because it's like, well, he was wrong, obviously, because the war happened. Meanwhile, he was telling everyone, not panic, not leave the country, keep doing what you're doing. Um, because now we understand that strategically, it was important to make sure that there wasn't panic happening before, just to sort of slow down the outflow of people, but also make sure that, you know, critical infrastructure was fully supplied with skilled labor and people were not just leaving the country. Um, I think the turning point for his support in terms of how Ukrainians perceived him happened uh, during the Munich Security Conference. Um, I think it was February 19th of, um, so just a few months ago when he gave a speech um, basically blaming the West for lack of support of Ukraine, but also perceiving Ukraine as a chess piece and larger geopolitical um, developments in the region. 
Um, and I think that that speech very much evoked a lot of sentimental and patriotic feelings for, for many Ukrainians, even my age, because this is how a lot of times we felt at an international stage. Um, as a Ukrainian, you go, you go to conferences and first thing that people ask you is like, what do you think about Putin? You know, it's never a question about how is life in Ukraine, what's happening in Ukraine, but it's always how is Ukraine in relation to, to Russia or w- what is Russia doing in the region? Um, and I think that's when I started seeing my even highly critical people of Zelensky started pushing their, um, their opinions. And then of course, when the war started, I think his uh, approval rating skyrocketed to what was it, 93%, um, which is probably the highest democratically elected, um, the, uh, highly, the highest approved democratically elected president in the world. Um, and I think at this point, people are still standing up behind him. Um, and I think his comedy background or entertainment background that so many people criticize him for is actually such a strategic advantage because I cannot imagine Poroshenko or any other politician in Ukraine drawing so much support, you know, making people empathize with him around the world. So, you know, I, I don't I don't see any other competition in the political area in Ukraine who, who would have done such a great job, you know, delivering speeches day and night to Ukrainians early morning in the evening, you know, shooting a few speeches to parliaments around the world, uh, showing up live on protests and rallies around the world. Um, I don't see anybody better prepared for this type of role um, in, in the country. And then, and then, Julia, you know, can, I, can I interrupt you there? Because it's yeah. an interesting, it is truly an interesting phenomenon. And your comments about pop culture remind me to, to refer everyone to this. Uh, sorry, it's the competition, Josh. Uh, interview that he did with the Atlantic in which you know one paragraph he's you know quoting the Beatles the next one it's Groundhog Day uh he's he's extremely skilled at this but has the national unity that he's created uh actually sort of made it likely that the war will go on longer that is that he can sustain a kind of support that other uh, leaders would not have been able to. I I absolutely think so because he he's very much in tune with the public opinion. Maybe in some ways he is manipulating public opinion. For example, the point with NATO, right? Because prior to the war, most of the Ukrainians were like, this is our choice if we want to join NATO or not. And this is not a reason to invade another country. Meanwhile, his rhetoric around joining NATO started shifting a few weeks into the war, where basically he started demonstrating Ukrainians, oh, look at NATO, it's so ineffective. We're asking them for help, we're pleading them to close the sky. And yet they just look at our kids dying and not doing anything. And immediately that evoked a very emotional response from Ukrainians saying, well, then we don't need NATO because they sort of left and abandoned us. And now we're all joking that NATO is going to apply to join armed forces of Ukraine, you know? right, right. but there is a lot of um, feelings of betrayal by NATO, and that has really started shifting a, a public opinion, and now that you see that, I think it's about 50% of Ukrainians are in support of, of joining NATO, so it is definitely well below uh, what was at the beginning of the war, so mm-hmm. I think his, again, his entertainment background helps him to really understand how to kind of take advantage of different trends and and pick up on what's happening in our society, but then also to really produce speeches and videos that can produce a certain response. Yeah. Um, Let me turn to Tim at this point, because, uh, you know, one issue, of course, in comparing uh, Putin and Zelensky is, of course, uh, the way in which leaders sustain uh, public support in the course of a war. We, we see all of these polls indicating strong support for Putin. And Tim has a long history in overseeing polls, uh, public opinion polling in, uh, in Russia. But you also see just as many uh, articles in the media about emergent cracks in the elite, uh, particularly divisions between Putin and the generals. 
What's your take on the domestic and internet and institutional backdrop of uh, for Putin as he maneuvers uh, in uh, sort of between now and May 9th or beyond, if you want? Great. That's a, that's a great question. And uh, thanks a lot, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm taking notes here as I'm going because the, the comments are so good. Uh, you know, the framework that I uh, and other political scientists bring to this work is that Putin, like all autocrats, faces these dual threats of uh, a coup um, by his inner circle and the threat of mass mobilization. And the tricky part is you it's difficult to reduce both of those threats at the same time. Typically, uh, you know, you can use your budgetary funds to support uh, guns or butter, and it's hard to do both. And what Putin has done is this great balancing act of, uh, uh, you know, keeping these two dual threats at bay. Uh, and I think the war has made that more difficult, not that he's in any uh, position that's under threat or likely to be overthrown anytime soon. There's a long causal chain between opposition to how the war is being prosecuted and actually uh, conducting a coup. But if I look at the, the support for the war, the way I, I often characterize it is that it's, it's broad in the sense that uh, uh, you know, most people are willing to give Putin the benefit of the doubt. Uh, Putin doesn't need 50% plus one uh, of the population to support him. He just needs enough people to, to go along so that uh, there's not really a threat to his rule, um, but also that it's fairly shallow. Uh, you know, prior to the war, Ukraine was not a burning issue for most Russians. Most Russians, according to the public opinion polls, were perfectly content uh, with an independent Ukraine. Uh, maybe they were annoyed uh, that it was uh, flirting with the West and with NATO. But the, you know, most Russians, you know, weren't getting up in the morning and thinking my God, my life would be so much better if we only controlled half of Eastern Ukraine. They had so many other issues that were much higher up on the, uh, on their, in their priorities. Uh, and also, in addition to being fairly broad, but fairly shallow, I think the support is also somewhat contingent in that, uh, you know, uh, as the economy uh, struggles and people are predicting, uh, you know, decline of about 10% of GDP uh, in this year alone, uh, you know, that that will eat in to Putin's support and make it more difficult to balance off these two uh, competing threats. Uh, and I think that sanctions are likely to continue to bite going forward. Uh, the other you know, public opinion also suggests that the state of the economy has long been a, a, a pretty robust predictor of, of people's attitudes towards uh, uh, Putin. Uh, you know, the other factor that is important is the facts on the ground. And it's, um, you know, generally public opinion about support for war efforts uh, draws a lot from the U.S. case. And one of the lessons is that, uh, you know, Americans were willing to tolerate losses on the battlefield as long as they thought the war effort was going in the right direction, that it was being competently prosecuted. And after the Tet Offensive and after um, uh, you know, people began to wonder whether the game was really worth the, the, the candle, uh, then uh, losses really became an important predictor for people's support for the war. So in the sense that you know, plan A seems not to have worked, plan B seems to be struggling along. Uh, you know, um, the perception of Putin as a competent leader, which is one of the important kind of pillars of his support is Putin is seen as somebody who kind of brought stability and a sense of competency back to the Russian government. Uh, you know, that's really in question. And you know, what Putin has done with this invasion is take his greatest achievement, you know, the return of stability to Russia and put it at risk. So, uh, you know, I, in, in a nutshell, I don't think that Putin is at risk of, of losing power anytime uh, soon, but his ability to manage and govern in the way that he has in the past um, uh, is really going to be under, under stress. And, you know, we see this increasing 
reliance on coercion, which is far different. It's just a far greater scale and scope of coercion and repression and, um, uh, than we've seen in the past. And in the same way that outside observers, like all of us, have trouble figuring out what's going on with Russian public opinion or Russian elite opinion, that problem is much more difficult for Putin now as well, uh, because people are likely to be less willing to uh, openly express their views about the war. And the same way that uh, you know the elites um, uh, uh, going along with the war, you know, could be very much uh, you know you know a sign of opportunism rather than sincere support. And Putin is smart enough to recognize that. So Putin has a legibility problem in the same way uh, that we do. And unfortunately, I think that means that uh, uh, you know, repression uh, is gonna continue to be the order of the day. So kind of Belarus on steroids um, is not an unreasonable expectation for what we're likely to see going forward. <laughs> Belarus on steroids is a pretty unappetizing <laughs> prospect here. Uh, I want to invite uh, the other participants in this uh, call to raise any questions that they might want to put to our panelists uh, by raising their hands. Um, and you can do that now the way it's set up, I think, in the reactions, under the reactions button, or you can uh, send a, an email to, um, uh, or a chat to Susan Storms. Uh, and she'll raise it. But I see we've got one question right away from uh, uh, John Porter. Uh, John, I don't see you on the screen, but if you start talking, I bet you will uh, we'll hear you. Is this better? I That's see better. Good. Now I see your hand there, yes. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> so nice to see you also. Um, a very quick question, and it might be a little bit controversial, but uh, certainly, Admitting, uh, you know, the horrible loss of lives and even, I would say, the war crimes in terms of the bombing of civilians, such a horrible situation now. The question is, could this, been, could this have been prevented if the U.S., perhaps Europe, but mostly the U.S., could have realized at one point that just like the U.S. in 1962 with the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was no way they were going to allow nuclear weapons, you know, 90 miles from the U.S. mainland, or actually Key West, I guess. Um, wouldn't it be rational for Putin, despite, you know, his means, to basically say we cannot have, you know, a strict ally of the West, you know, on our southeastern border, and even less NATO and nuclear arms? So, it seems to me a lot of could, could have been prevented had we worked out a solution earlier to keep Ukraine neutral, or is Putin just desperate and he was going to invade anyway, regardless? Because clearly he was setting this up, given the fact that he was amassing a lot of foreign exchange reserves, reducing budget deficits, reducing current account deficits. So it certainly didn't seem a whim. But could this have been presented with better diplomacy? I'll give you an answer that I've heard from a number of uh, sort of Russian commentators in the immediate aftermath of the invasion. It was, they thought that just as you've been saying that this was about sort of the security order of Europe uh, and that, you know, really the, if that were the case, what Putin should have done is kept the diplomacy going uh, with, you know, uh, no real chance of getting an ironclad, permanent, no Ukraine in NATO ever pledge, but with the practical equivalent of that. And they said, in kind of stunned response to the invasion, now we discover something else is going on. <laughs> that we had a different agenda, actually. But I don't want to for keep uh, the other uh, or keep our panelists from commenting on this. Uh, Tim or Josh or Yulia? I'll just say quickly, maybe Yulia will have more to say about this, but what that question doesn't uh, make room for is the agency of Ukrainian, both successive um, 
uh, governments, political leaderships, as well as the Ukrainian people them, themselves. And, and, and it, this wasn't really a question for the US or the West to decide on their own about what Ukraine's not just um, kind of security orientation would be, but as Steve said, what turns out to be, I think, more crucial for Putin's thinking here is that kind of historical socio-psychological mission about Ukraine's orientation and its drift away from the Russian nation. The, it's, it's the kind of the place where it historically belongs in Putin's estimation. And he had to prevent uh, losing Ukraine forever. This was the last moment, right, in which he could kind of pr preserve this brotherhood by force as it should be. Um, and, and so, you know, those are questions for, for Ukraine to decide, right? It's kind of historical orientation, leaving apart the question of, of kind of what security alliances does Ukraine feel, you know, are in its national interest. We're talking about a sort of deeper um, process that is even harder for the United States and the West to stop this idea of Ukraine developing an identity that either is in some way individually Ukrainian that threatens Russia's um, implicit dominance over Ukraine or, or European that, that effectively does the same thing, but, but perhaps Yulia and maybe Tim have more to say about this, but I, I too am in, in a word skeptical in hindsight about how much the West or the United States in particular could have done here to keep Putin from ending up at the decision uh, that he ultimately made. Yeah. Yeah, I would hey, absolutely Yulia, step quick, in. Quickly so we can get yeah. other uh, other questions. Yeah. And thanks kind of Joshua pointing that a lot of times these conversations or these questions really kind of bypass Ukraine as an actor and it's a country of 42 million people that also have opinions on what the status of their country should be. And so when we talk about what US should negotiate with Russia regarding to Ukraine, it really kind of sounds as if Ukraine is just a political chess piece, which as a Ukrainian, and I find slightly offensive, and I'm getting into the same argument with um, with Jeffrey Sachs, who in the beginning of war published an op-ed in Financial Times saying that, oh, it's all about NATO, so the U.S. should negotiate with Russia for, for Ukraine to abandon NATO plans. But I think the bigger question here is if you listen to a full speech by Putin that he gave um, two days prior to the war, there were not that many points he was reasoning with regarding Russia security, but rather he gave this 40 minute lecture on what he sees as a historical justice. And I honestly think that in Putin's political career, Ukraine has been his biggest failure because it's the only country in the region that chose a very strong divergent path further away from Russia. And actually Zelensky election has proven that Ukraine is indeed a democratic country because many people in Russia knew about Zelensky. So you have a country with a democratically elected president choosing completely opposite path to what Russia wants it to go. And it continues to kind of go further that way. And then, you know, further um, association with the EU visa-free regime. Um, so, and actually Jeffrey Sachs posted another op-ed just two days ago, continuing to push for that, for that argument that it's just about NATO, but it's such a reductionist approach and it also completely emits Ukraine out of a conversation. Um, so as a, as a Ukrainian, please do not forget to bring in Ukraine <laughs> into the discussion. It's not about the US and, and Russia and historically it's not. And it completely emits the history between the two countries of oppression, totalitarianism and repression. Tim, quick two sentence uh, contribution here or should we move on to the next? I agree. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> That's just one sentence. I like that. Uh, Angela Atre, and then I'm going to start looking for some questions from the uh, from the chat. Angela, hey. go ahead. Good to see Hi. you. Good to see you too. Um, and thank you so much for the for the roundtable. This has been great. Um, I think just before the 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 event started, there was some news about Gazprom halting supplies of gas to Poland, um, which of course is a, a new extension. I think in, of this conflict, of course just more generally between Russia and the West. So I'm curious to hear what the panelists feel about how this might be viewed within Russia um, and whether, I suppose by extension, whether Poland is sort of seen still as part of that presumed has sort of Russian sphere of influence, i.e. what Joshua was referring to as this emotional psychological union or brotherhood. Thanks. Okay, the energy weapon gets uh, unsheathed. Uh 
by Gazprom uh, against the Poles, presumably because the Poles are the main conduit of arms uh, going into Ukraine or uh, perhaps for other reasons. Anybody want to take a crack at that? Tim, since we, uh, we gave you the least airtime in the last question. Oh, I mean, one thing I think we, we have underestimated is what Russia's countermeasures are going to be. Uh, and to my mind, it's been surprising that we haven't seen more moves like this, uh, either cyber attacks against uh, uh, Western financial institutions uh, or moves where Russia might have some leverage in the, uh, uh, in the energy sphere. Uh, we'll see how long this lasts. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's a, in the longer run, this is really a self-defeating strategy for Russia. Um, you know, the, uh, not only has the um, invasion of Ukraine uh, changed minds in Finland and Sweden, uh, but it's also really accelerated the move, or at least the commitments uh, of Europeans to wean themselves off from Russian energy. Uh, which people had been expecting would take place over a decade, and now people have rapidly moved up those timetables. Um, so, in this sense, you know, Russia maybe even cutting off its its nose to spite its face here. Um, in that, I don't think it's going to have a huge impact on uh, on the behavior of the Polish government, um, and uh, you know, maybe it's trying to send a broader signal to the Euro you know to other European countries that. You know, Russia has weapons as well, but over the longer term, you know, Russia is just increasingly seen as a country that you do not want your energy future tied to, uh, and in the long run, that can't be good for Russia. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to start reading a lot about how the Poles have been increasing their stocks of, <laughs> uh, of gas and oil so as to mm -hmm. get themselves through the, uh, you know, yeah. the need for... Uh, for heavy energy imports from Russia, but they've already done that to a very considerable extent. Yeah. Poland may not be the most vulnerable country in the East. Josh or Yulia, you wanna add something here or? Well, only a very quick um, ominous coda to Tim's comments, which I um, agree with, which is that if you listen to, to Putin and other officials and read the Russian press and talk to people in Russia, you get the sense that for Putin and co, they are convinced that this is the opening phase of what is and, and certainly will become a war, not with Ukraine, but with the West and the United States more broadly. They are convinced, you know, whether this is like how true or not this is, that it's true for them that they are in uh, a war, not with Ukraine, but with uh, the West writ large. And I think that some of these weapons that Tim mentioned that we haven't seen used fully, the full breadth of cyber attacks, energy as a weapon to the extent that it could be, I think that those are being held back because the real war potentially is still to come as, as the Kremlin sees it. This is actually the kind of warm up uh, to the true war that Putin uh, and his coterie have been preparing for for some time. And so the, this, this kind of arsenal of measures against the West will be unleashed you know, if and when uh, that phase uh, were to happen. Again, I'm, I'm not making an objective prognosis about what I think will happen. I'm trying to sort of understand what I, how I imagine. Um, right. Those no, I, I think you're tiptoeing up to Churchill's quote again, you know, maybe not even the end of the beginning <laughs> or, or the end of the beginning, but the, what's to follow will be worse, not better. Um, you know, Tim, you, uh, you raised this question of the war with the West. Mm -hmm. And one of our questioners asks, um, I think this is Alan Grafman uh, says, is it an, uh, announcing it, that the goal is to weaken Russia mm -hmm. a good move or not? Uh, General Austin uh, said that maybe in kind of an aside, I'm not too clear uh, after visiting Kiev, uh, and there's been a lot of journalistic focus on that issue. Um, good move or not, Tim, Yulia, Josh? It's not. I, I, I'll start. Uh, you know, I don't think it's a bad goal to have. I'm not sure it's a great goal to announce. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, you know, the more that this is perceived, particularly within Russia, as a fight with Ukraine, that's a much harder argument for the Kremlin to make than uh, an argument um, that this is really a war with the West. And, you know, the Kremlin can make 
arguments, it doesn't mean necessarily that uh, uh, people buy them. So, you know, the West, you know, however we want to conceive of it, needs to kind of walk a fine line to keep the focus on, you know, Russia, Ukraine, and not allow this to be turned into a, a you know, a rhetorical or the give Kremlin the, the rhetorical tool uh, that to frame this as a battle between uh, uh, Russia and, uh, uh, and the West. Yulia? But I, always, yeah. I always wonder what capacity they have. If, if, that, if they were to scale up to the West, you know, they already seem to be running out of their capacity in Ukraine. And even in terms of cyber attacks, do not forget that Ukraine has a very strong um, cyber army as well that is hacking successfully into major Russian institutions. And a lot of Russia capacity right now is directed towards counteracting that. Um, so I just, I think it's more of a, of a talk. It's more of a strategy to scare yeah. other people. I even know, like my friends here in the U.S. are all preparing for the war or afraid that there's going to be a great mobilization in the U.S., which is completely unreasonable because to me, it seems like they, they're already stuck, stuck in Ukraine. Yes, they can throw more people and more of their, unfortunately, fortunately, garbage uh, weaponry, but this is not really going to make the case. So besides nuclear weapons, they don't have anything to go so i think it's just an empty talk the uh i want to invite people again to uh, uh raise their hands if they want to ask a question but i'll keep uh, uh pulling them out of the chat uh, um and uh, i see susan is has got her hand raised uh susan do you want to pose a question that's in the chat or Sure. I also I sent some questions to you in your chat if it came in. Yeah. Okay. I see one from Irv Irvin Oliver. That's uh, this is the kind of <laughs> this is the biggest hardest kind of question to uh, to address. But I'll put it to our panelists anyway. Uh, you know what are Russia's strategic objectives now, and are those objectives worth the cost? It looks like Russia has paid and looks to continue to continue paying. A uh, tough question to disentangle, uh, but, and maybe there's not a single answer to the question of whether Russia has, quote, um, Russia has strategic objectives. Uh, maybe this is all contingent, but uh, maybe you can say a word about how you see that and what opening it leads. And some of the other questions have touched on this for a diplomatic a resolution of the, uh, of the conflict. Anybody want to pick that one up? I'll say hopefully quickly that I actually think that Russia's strategic aims have not changed that much since the start of the war. A separate question is how achievable they are, how realistic they are. The second yeah. part of the question is sort of worth it, quote unquote. Um, and there's been a, certainly a tactical shift, right, in the move toward the focus on the Donbass as opposed to trying to take Kiev and other cities. But strategically, I think Putin still believes the mission is to, uh, by force, sort of rest or, or knock Ukraine off of its Western uh, course, by force uh, bring at least part of the country back into the Russian sphere of orbit and influence, uh, leave a rump Ukraine that is weakened militarily and economically that won't have the ability to reconstitute itself in a way that pre prevents, presents uh, a long-term threat uh, to Russia to sort of bend Ukrainian um, political um, and, and, and kind of, you know, psychic history in a way that aligns with uh, this sort of dark reading of Ukrainian history that, that Yulia mentioned that Putin laid out very clearly for us on the 21st of February. I think all of that is still in play. And I think that Putin believes that that's still the mission. There's been a sort of tactical readjustment. Uh, but, but you know, in and, and that sense, plan A is still in force. A separate question being, of course, you know, how delusional or not is Putin in thinking that that's an achievable goal? Well, but that isn't a separate question anymore, Josh, because <laughs> if one is talking about attaining control over maybe almost unchallenged military control over 
you know, what are typically depicted in the maps every day in the papers is, you know, the red, the red bands around the south and east. Um, that guarantees that Ukraine's orientation to the west is strengthened and, uh, and maybe uh, accelerated. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I wonder what uh, Yulia and Tim would uh, would have to add on this point. Well, the, the strategic objectives have often uh, backfired on Putin and his approach to Ukraine, which, of course, you know, began with uh, prior to the annexation and the war in uh, eastern Ukraine starting in 2015, you know, NATO support was low. Uh, you know, after eight years of war, even before. Uh, the initiation of the large-scale conflict, um, you know, support for NATO had grown to, uh, you know, uh, sixty percent or whatever, whatever figure. So, I think, I think you're both right in that. I think Putin still sees it the way Josh does, but Steve is right: is that this is the way things are going to turn out. That uh, you know, the whatever is left of Ukraine will be very uh, uh, pro-Western in the same way that you know. Finland and Sweden are now banging down the door to, jo to join NATO. Um, there will be, um, uh, you know, a, a, you know, uh, a lot. Two things. One is, you know, the support for Western integration in Ukraine will be very high, uh, and opposition to Russian influence uh, will also be very high. And you know, it's going to take a long time uh, for that uh, uh, feeling uh, uh, to to abate. So, um, great. We are uh, a minute past time, so I am going to turn uh, this over to Susan Storms in a moment. But I want to give Yulia the last word if she wants to uh, uh, add a, a add a thought to what uh, Josh and uh, Tim have just said about the conflict for Putin between what he set out to. <laughs> to achieve on February 24th and where he is on April 26th. Yeah, I'm more of a believer where I think he really thought that there will be a much larger support for Russia in Ukraine. And there have been some news reports that said that whatever information that he has been receiving from um, Russian security services were confirming kind of his bias that there's a lot more support for Russia in Ukraine. I think the level of strong opposition is not something that they, that they expected. And even the conversation that, that Ukrainian forces intercept all point out that even Russian soldiers were not expecting such level of resistance, even from, from average Ukrainians. Um, so, and then there were also were news that some of the units with, within security services in Russia have been dismissed who were supposed to be doing that kind of preparation work before the war. Um, so I think that in terms of that strategy, now they're just moving to straight up force threat and capture of territories and destruction of the territories that do not give in. Um, in terms of winning the hearts of Ukrainians, that strategy is over. Yeah. Well, way beyond the turning point in that. Yeah. If, uh, my last sentence on this uh, will be, since it's kind of been hinted at in, uh, in things that all three of you have said is uh, that there's a tremendous potential here for institutional friction and finger pointing. Uh, you know, in some of these accounts, one might say, okay, the military have been the ones who've really screwed up. But here we've also been hearing about the wrong intelligence assessments and the military are doubtless going to be invoking all of that to say, oh, no, 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 we, we did what we could, but you were yeah. they badly misinformed about this country. They could both be right. Yeah, 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 <laughs> and, and, sure, and probably are. Look, we have to call this uh, to a halt. We're having too much fun here. Uh, but Susan has uh, thoughtfully uh, left open the option of... Uh, 20 minutes or so of breakout uh, conversations uh, in groups that people uh, can join as they uh, as they see fit. So I'm going to turn things over to Susan here 
and uh, let her run the show from here on in. I do want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, as I've found myself saying in an awful lot of sessions on Ukraine of late, uh, we're going to have a chance to do this again <laughs> because this subject is, uh, alas, uh, going to be with us for a while. It's only the end of the beginning. Susan, over to you. Thank you, Steve. Um, thank you so much for facilitating such an important and informative conversation for us today. And to our panelists, thank you for sharing your deep expertise and your personal reflections on the war in Ukraine. We're very grateful for your time today and that you gave us the opportunity to bring this group together. And to our guests, we're very pleased you joined us today and I hope you found the discussion valuable. <laughs>